Hey everyone, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you're getting this uh, from. This is the Barbell Medicine crew. Minus like Vanessa, Hassan, Alex, Charlie, Charlie, Derek, Derek, Derek Joe. Joe. And We're missing some of them, Jess. <laughs> We're missing some people. We're missing some people. We're in Chicago. Uh, we're gonna talk about coaching. So we wanted to get a broad panel of individuals to talk about coaching today. This is the disclaimer to start this off. This is not like a well-researched, evidence-based review of marketing data, sales data, coaching. Like, this is more just our opinion. Yeah. It's similar to- uh, Opinion and experience. The Med School podcast. Yes. But we're gonna include some other perspectives and try to inform you, the listener or uh, viewer at home about how we got to where we're at today and then maybe steps for going forward if you want to become a coach um, because we get that question all the time. This was actually prompted by a question in San Antonio where it was like, how do I let people know that I'm willing to help them with my co with the coaching? It's like, oh, there's, a, there's a long story there. So uh, let's start out with this. Let's start out with uh, how we all got started. Um, Alan Thrall. When did you start coaching? Why did you start coaching? And then like, what's been your, your journey? I started coaching in 2013. So it's, real, well, before that I coached uh, like high school team. Um, but actually coaching one-on-one -on -one was when I opened the gym. Um, and it was kind of out of necessity. I didn't really have much structure to opening the gym. I was just like, if someone comes in, I'm gonna help them out and take them through a workout. Sure. Uh, and I started out wanting to do group uh, training. Sometimes there was a group, but oftentimes it was three people or two people, or sometimes one person would show up to the group session. When it I turned first out to out. not be a group. Yep, so it was more personal, it was personal <laughs> training that was, you know, one person group training. Um, so, so I was coaching a lot, I was coaching a lot of people like that. Very uh, small group training. <laughs> <laughs> Smallest group. Micro group training, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so that's, that's how I started coaching uh, more one-on-one -on -one outside of uh, coaching teams. But so did you, you opened the gym like right when you started coaching? Yep, I opened the gym complete scratch, like no experience. I didn't have any clients built up. Yeah, so I was just like, I want, I want a gym. Yeah. So anybody who came into the gym was automatically your client. You weren't like sitting, waiting for some gym manager or personal training manager to like divvy up new clients to you. It was just, it was you. You come to my gym, well, you gotta know who I am. I didn't think you said that out loud. But was, <laughs> how long do you think it took before you felt comfortable actually coaching somebody? Like, did you have any like fear initially, like trepidation? Like, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just opened a gym, people are coming in, they wanted me to like, you know, take them through a workout or like give them a training plan. Do, were you confident initially? Um, d d talking to people, uh, I was always uh, a bit unsure of what to say. Uh, meaning, talking to people like, why should I come to your gym? Being a salesperson, I wasn't very good at. Um, but I would say that like telling someone what to do uh, came fairly easy getting out of the Marine Corps. And just, I mean, honestly, like some people, you know, like here's a workout, tell Jordan to do it. And you're like, um, if you want, you can like, you know what I mean? So like being somewhat assertive was, was easy. Um, uh, so yeah. Yeah. But that was uh, that probably came from being in the military beforehand, um, and so there was a little bit of a transition, but it wasn't too bad. Looking looking back now, like how long do you think it took for you to become a coach, like a good coach in your own mind? Because like you can only tell this retrospectively. You can't like everyone thinks they're awesome when they start, right? But then like five years later, you're like, Ooh, yeah, can't believe uh, I started there. I would say that uh, once I was finally a, a coach. Uh, coached by Austin uh, was when I was like, mm, so this is this is uh, <laughs> this is like what good coaching is, uh, and so I learned a lot about coaching uh, and you know about programming the lifts and whatnot, sure. um, and so all of that uh, definitely after Austin. Before that, it was just a you know like a couple of years of uh, probably not the best advice. But did you get any certifications along the way? Like, what was your first cert? Like, how did you starting strength coach? That was your first cert. Yep. So you opened a gym. You didn't even have a cert. I opened a gym, <laughs> it was the worst business plan with nothing, no business experience, no credentials, no clients. Maybe no, the best, maybe I never the best worked in a plan. gym. Yeah, I guess, maybe. Um, I was just uh, really motivated and uh, a bit naive and I just wanted to start a gym. Yeah, and oh, so we'll link his, uh, hey, I started a gym <laughs> video just so you guys can, that's a cool story. Uh, Tom, let's move to you next. When did you start coaching 
and like how did you, this come about? Like what were you doing? I taught martial arts in college. And then for barbell coaching, like 2008, 2009, I started informally coaching people. And then uh, by 2010, people were paying me to coach them. And like, how did you get involved in that? Like, you, like somebody that you were training in martial arts was like, hey, I also want to get strong. Or, uh, or was it like you got interested yourself in training and that kind of... There was no, there was no like carryover from my time coaching martial arts, but just as far as coaching people and like being in front of people and giving instruction that probably started it. But as far as the barbell stuff, it was, there was no point at which it was like, aha, um, it was sort of a gradual thing. The more I was lifting and the more I was looking at stuff, the more people came to me for advice. So people were just coming up to you or like, yes. Yes. Sir Campitelli, will you please teach me? Because I was in a CrossFit gym at the time. And so the idea that people would go and like actually work on strength in a dedicated fashion was kind of a novel thing. At that time in 2000, yeah, 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 for sure. So that, that attracted attention. Yeah. And then what was your first certification? Like, how'd you get started? Starting strength coach. Yeah. And that's the, that is the only like, you know, fitness certification I got. And I got that in February of 2010. 2010, yeah. So it wasn't like, I'm gonna get all these certs. I'm gonna go to a personal, like a, a global gym, coach a bunch of people. You were just in a gym and people started asking you. Admiring that squat. I mean, he's a <laughs> mastodon after all. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Leah, so same, same sort of question to you. Like, when did you start? What certifications did you get? Uh, and how did you get started coaching? So I think I was coaching people informally in about 2014 and by 2015, I was being paid by some people to coach them and I was running small group classes okay. in my gym. Not like very small group classes. But no, I was actually running, my, my, my classes were full. <laughs> <laughs> I had a waiting list for my classes. Sure, no. yeah. um, so I was teaching barbell classes a couple days a week okay. and uh, then I was coaching some people independently as well. And then how does that start? Like people just started asking you or you were like going up, hey, 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 let me coach you. <laughs> right. So initially it was people were asking me for help. Um, I'm a pretty open person at the gym. So I was willing to um, offer insight or advice. And then when I decided that I wanted to learn to become a better coach, I did get a little bit more aggressive about finding people to coach. And I offered to coach people if they were interested and then the only certification that I got was the starting strength certifi certification. And when I wanted that, I decided that I needed to coach a broader spectrum of lifters. And so I actually um, asked different types of people if they would be willing to work with me so that I could have more practice. But before that, you never had asked somebody to, no. yeah, no. they would just call, would come up to you. Yeah, come yeah. up to me. Yep. Yeah, I see. Yep. And then what did you want to become a coach? What's the... Just Why? Get, just get bored or like? <laughs> well. Right. It was just it, lifting and training and all of that that goes with it was so important in my own life. And I think that that showed to the people around me. But as it became so important to me, I was really excited about working with other people who cared about the same idea. So I loved it. Uh, so I, I kind of grew up, uh, I played multiple sports, but throughout my swimming career, as I went through swimming, I started to coach more and more of the younger kind of age groups behind me to the point where as I got to the upper age groups, I started, you know, I was getting, uh, I was coaching more and more individuals in the pool. And so I had a long, I, I'd been coaching some form of like, you know, human movement, I guess, so to speak, or sports performance for for a while, both formally getting paid and informally prior to that. And so that kind of had been going on for a long time after I finished swimming and I decided to pick up a barbell to avoid getting super fat from not being a, is this a real swimmer word? anymore. Oh yeah. Like this really? is a common thing among swimmers. No, no, no. I know that it happens. I'm just saying for you personally. Yeah. I was like, like uh, I don't want that to happen to me. So let me go find something else to do. Cause swimming by myself in the pool is super boring sure. uh, without a team around me. So I found, you know, I started to pick up a bar and started training, did all kinds of wacky stuff. Um, but, um, I mean, we, I've talked about this a bit before where I didn't coach anybody for quite a long, for probably a couple of years when I was starting out with the, with the bar until I was training at a college gym, um, when, when, when I was in med school. And by that point I was actually getting decently strong and I was squatting, you know, 
approaching 405 at the time and people, you know, at the time in that gym, that was like not common. So right. I started to get some attention. And um, by the time I was squatting, you know, 405 or more, that started to get a lot of attention. And that was around the time I think I met you and you were like, uh, hey, dude, you ever, you know, like coached anybody on this stuff? And I was like, well, I've helped a few, been helping a few people out in the gym. And then we decided to pursue it a little bit more formally from there. And kind of and in parallel to that, my whole like academic career, I had been kind of also kind of like coaching, teaching, stuff like that. And so I think for as far as like why I ended up getting into it, it was kind of an something that has always been part of what I do in terms of teaching other people, um, both in academics, in, in, you know, in sport, athletics, and, you know, something I still do now in medicine too. So it's kind of just how I end up doing it. Paying it forward. Yeah. 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 I suppose. Yeah. A little bit. Nobody cares what I did. So we'll just like move on with this (laughs) on to the next one. Uh, yeah, moving on. <laughs> well, Jordan, I, Jordan, did you get any uh, certifications along the way? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, I, so I, I mean, I worked at a, a company called Vitek Systems, which is now BU Marriu, uh, which is a subsidiary of Boeing. That's what I did out after college. I just got a biology degree, and I was like, I didn't know at the time you couldn't do anything with a biology degree besides like you know work as a lab like tech or whatever. But you didn't really need a biology degree to do that. So in any event, I was pouring plates all day, just micro like to stain. But I wasn't even doing the staining. I was literally just pouring the plates. Like a machine could Something, have, uh, yeah, could have been mechanized, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so I was like waiting for my job to be replaced by a machine. Um, and uh, so I did it for three months after I graduated and I was like, I hate everything about this. Like, I, I, you know, I hate everything about this. This is terrible, like, get me out of here. What do I like? And I, I had gotten really into training when I was in college. Um, and at the time, like you think about this, 2005, 2006, 2007 on the internet, there's nothing on the internet about training besides like Dave Tate's deep squatter and like Dave Tate telling you to pour olive oil on your pizza. Like that's, (laughs) that's it. Right. And so, you know, you can't. Yeah, I mean, if you want an olive oil, yeah, I mean, if it fits your macros, I guess. Um, yeah, so at the time, it was just harder to learn this stuff, right? And so, but, I, you know, I had a really an interest in um, exercise physiology and uh, exercise physio- physiology assessment. I ended up taking all these extra classes, graduated with a bunch of extra credits. Um, and I thought that was interesting. So but anyway, I was working in this terrible job, and I was like, what do I do now? And I was like, what do I like? What is even enjoyable? So I was like, I'm going to become, I'm going to go train people at this gym. I was at this gym training and people like members had asked me to like, Hey man, what are you doing? It's all dudes. Of course. Like I thought I was getting a lifting to like pick up chicks. It was all dudes. Like, Hey, how, what do you bench? Like, what are you, you know? Well, yeah, I know it ends up working out fine, but it's, it's <laughs> don't let this be a lesson. Don't do anything for, <laughs> 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 yeah, to get yourself a date. Cause it's gonna, it's just gonna backfire. So in any, in any event, I uh, started coaching at a commercial gym and I got like, I thought, I think every cert that was available at the time, like I did the CSCS, I did the ACSM HFS, I did a CrossFit, I did USAW, I did USA Track and Field, I did the CISSN, I did a, I went to a RKC. Uh, like oh, cool. I didn't know about the RKC. Yeah, dude. Like, and then they wanted you to test and I was like, no, this is stupid. <laughs> so, um, like, yeah, it, I, I did a lot of this because I thought it would ultimately give me two things. One, like cachet, like, oh, this guy's got all this. These Letters. Sort of case- Letters, <laughs> places, yeah. Uh, oh, that was gonna help like get business. And then the other thing I thought it would actually teach me to know things about training. And to some extent, like the minimum requirements that you're passing on these tests, like probably do impart some like knowledge base, uh, you know, but the, the, it, I never felt like, I know what I'm doing here. Like I never felt like that until much later in my, coaching career like I know how to program I know how to coach the lifts I like feel comfortable giving people advice like on these things I never like I was so like scared is the wrong word but like just very aware of how tenuous my knowledge base was on these things because I was still asking questions for myself I'm like how what's the best way to get your squat to go up like I still had questions yeah. about that you know and the people were like why are you having me do this I'm like I mean you know I think that works it's for like, me yeah I guess <laughs> I think <laughs> Yeah, but I was very fortunate. I mean, uh, I'm going to ask you guys about your, uh, you know, a client uh, sort of situation. So, like, my first client, I remember that I ever trained. Her name's Jana. Hi, Jana. She watches all the stuff now. She's, she's cool. But um, it was so interesting. I, I was like, I was like, I'm going to have you squat. Like, I, like the second session or whatever, I had to squat under a bar and then bench and deadlift. But nobody else in the gym was doing it at the time. So, everyone thought it was crazy. They're like, you're having her 
squat, bench, deadlift? I'm like, well, yeah, because that's what I would want to do. I can't like sell somebody training and then have them do stuff that I would never do. You know, like these weird, like I'm going to hop over an exercise box and I'm going to like stand on a BOSU ball and then do like this weird burpee, all designed just to like make you feel tired, which, you know, is better than not exercising. But so I just had people do stuff that I would want to do and like plan their workouts that way, which tended to work out like, I guess it's good that I liked powerlifting or something. You know, well, it comes it. with some selection bias in that they're not, you know, if they see you doing that and then they want to come to you, right? So whereas other people who would have no interest in doing that, they wouldn't have approached you in the first place. Yeah, nobody's like hiring me and they're like, hey, you want to do like some boxing stuff? Yeah. Like, uh, what? You were just, you were just, you know, winning based off of the selection bias there probably. 100%. I mean, way to take me down a peg, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> I thought these people actually wanted my... Yeah, right, right. It turns out, turns out, yeah, turns out not, not so much. All right, so Alan, the first time somebody comes in your gym and decides to pay you to coach, what was what that? Like, that was 2013, I assume, because you're still in business. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have taken too long. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, like I said, the, the whole, uh, when I first opened the gym, it was all supposed to be group or class uh, training. That's the structure. There wasn't, I didn't have like oh, a one-on-one, -on -one. One -on -one. Yeah, right. uh, but it would just be, uh, you know, one person to show up and then they'd get the, the kind of the workout of the day. I would run them through it. Yeah. Um, you were doing uh, a CrossFit, it was a CrossFit gym? No. You had heard of CrossFit? Yeah. Yeah. It was I, like, it was like strongman circuit training. Oh, like, okay. Push this sled, carry these farmers handles. Probably like what you did with the, some dead the military. military with, your, yeah. uh, with your buddies. Yeah. 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 Very similar to that. Um, and then uh, I don't remember the, like the first time I said, I'm, I think I'm gonna start you know, charging people separately for one-on-one -on -one coaching. Oh, this was all like involved in, in, yeah, this was like in, the, in the gym. Like, yeah, sign up for the gym, I'll take you through a workout, okay. you know, basically. Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, but I do remember um, having a lot of uh, older women that I would train for one-on-one -on -one clients. Um, I don't know what it was, but there were a lot of them that. Well, but that's with. that's a that's not a unique story though. Like people in the personal training, people in the coaching. Like I think all of us. If you say, "Hey, what is your bread and butter client?" You know, it ends up being like uh, a, a middle age, middle age, or or just at least a not twenty something female. Like just thirty plus. That tends to be a bulk of your market, unless you're like in this really strange like niche you're like yeah all i ever train are like athletes mm -hmm. like and it's like okay cool like i hope you enjoy like not actually making a living from this you know for very long because you, it's hard to it's very difficult to do that also like the reimbursement's not that great unless you're winning championships and the moment you're not winning championships you're out and should you ever hurt somebody <laughs> like not that you actually hurt but they became you know yeah. that's that's not a great way to build a business also there's only so many uh elite level athletes. Yeah. And the odds of them living in your city and like wanting to train with you. I mean, I guess if you move to Miami or LA, maybe, you know, that might improve your chances, but even then, like, so I don't think that's unique. I'm talking about like retired, like, yeah, yeah. like they, they were, that should be your <clears throat> a lot of it was mornings and afternoons would be with retired women who didn't work. Yeah. Uh, and then in the evening would be the bigger crowd where I would actually get people to show up for a group session. Sure. But as far as one-on-one -on -one training, uh, yeah, it was a lot of, uh, some, some older retired men, but it was just, I remember working with a lot of uh, retired women. Sure. Leah, do you think most of your clients originally were women? Uh, yes, yes. In fact, I, my first class, everybody assumed it was a women's lifting class and I did not want it to, I didn't want it to stay this program where it was only, where I only trained women. I wanted to be training people. Um, I love training women, but yeah, all my first clients were women. All women? Yep. What do you think it is now? Like what's the split? Uh, it's actually more men now. Oh, really? Coach. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. What about yours? I, so you first like started your first client as your wife. It was not actually. No, no, <laughs> no. Cause she was a runner for a long time. And I was like, you know, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna influence that until she, uh, you know, developed interest in wanting to learn how to lift. That was later on. But like I said, I was training in that college gym at the time. And so when I was lifting heavy weights and the college dudes mostly were, you know, taking interest in that. So that was what most of my client base was. picked up a bunch of guys. <laughs> at at first was, fine. yeah, I mean, that's who was there. And, and initially, you know, I was giving them technical advice or teaching them the lifts and I was not charging for any of that. And then once things, you know, picked up a little bit more and people were wanting some programming guidance and stuff like that, then that's kind of where I started to feel comfortable at least charging even a little bit, which was not very much at the time, but yeah. that's when I felt ready to do that. 
And Tom, you're, you were in a CrossFit gym. Right. I assume you were paying to go to that CrossFit gym. At the time, yes. Were they coaching you? Uh, I st- No, I actually what happened was I asked to be able to work on my own, which no one else was doing. You wanted to open gym for yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I got, I got permission to work on my own. But so then you're like, people are coming up to you and they're like, Tom, 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 Tom we know you went to the games 2008. Like, we know that- <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. In fact, uh, it was, it was 2000, it was 2009 and I started doing this before that. Yeah. yeah well, so, so uh, yeah, all joke, all jokes aside, <laughs> but so, so you're at this gym, you already have like a unique membership, you know, cause you're the only one doing an open gym. And then also people are asking you to coach them. And the gym, the, the ownership's like, cool. Yeah. Um, mostly because I had been there for a year, a year plus already. And I had shown myself to be a reasonable human and I wasn't actually, uh, troublesome. And so I started doing my own thing and the gym owner was supportive of it. And then it wasn't like there was some mass migration of everyone like doing CrossFit to or like, wanna, Oh, we just want to train with Tom. But no, that, that did not happen. Train with Tom. Yeah. Well, but I think that brings up like, that starts a, like a kind of an important point. It's like, well, how do I get started coaching? Right. Well, like you have to coach and, but before that you actually have to train yourself. Mm-hmm. So all of us have like a very similar like origin story. Like I started getting into this. This became a big part of my life. I spent a lot of time doing this. And so at some point, people are going to ask you for some expertise. And that point is your time to kind of, you know, it's a decision point. Like, do I want to like try out my coaching chops? Do I want to develop this? Or like, am I totally fine not doing that and like moving on in other aspects of my life and sending them on the way? That expertise needs to be demonstrated in some some fashion, right? Sure. And that's kind of what we're talking about is that you have to have trained and achieved some level of competence with it for anybody to ask your advice. And it doesn't end up being where you you train and you enjoy it you're terrible at it. And so you go down, like beating down everybody's door, trying to get them to let right, you right, coach right. them. Yeah. You don't need to adver- how this works. Yeah. Nobody advertised their services from ground, from like day one where it like, because you need to have like something that's valuable, a demonstrably valuable mm-hmm. skill set where people are seeking you out. And then you were trying to magnify that in a way. So like Tom's in this what I would consider a hostile environment because there are other it was people, a friendly environment. you know, because other people are getting coaching. Right. And like it, you would have to assume on some level, like that coaching is incomplete or, you know, at least not doesn't align with your goals. And so I'm going to get this additional coaching or a coaching instead of this, you know, from this other guy. And so, and the other part of that is it's not like you were squatting like 500 for sets of five, but you had demonstrated that you had been training and you had, proficiency in what you were doing and you weren't trying to step outside of that. If somebody was like, yeah, and I actually, I want to squat, learn to squat and deadlift and bench and press, but I also want to, you know, train for this ultra marathon. You know, there's, there's like a point where you're like, "Ah, but I actually don't know how to do that. And to, to your point, you know, I went, I went from like shockingly weak to less weak and I uh, put on weight in that process, which was something that people weren't really doing. Right. So it, it wasn't like I was squatting 500 pounds. Uh, sure. I was squatting a lot less than 500 pounds, but there was a, a change that was unusual in the context that I was in. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. like, it wasn't a hostile environment in so much as like the gym owner is like, you better not be doing that. In no, fact, no, the gym no. owner, the gym owner was actually supportive of it. So yeah. But I'm just saying that the people you'd ha- you're you're saying that your your clientele or would be your clientele were informed consumers because if you thought well, I mean I have a coach, right. you know, so they said no no I want a little bit more, yeah and so and then so you were at the gym you were working out at the gym where you got your your clients initially same thing like you were literally working out at ODU mm-hmm. where people were approaching you yep you didn't just decide one you didn't wake up and one said I want to be a coach and wait for not. people to like email you. <laughs> no. well, and then yep. you were at, at you were at West yep. and then people had already been coming up to you. Yes. So Alan, you like created a space for people to come to you for expertise, but in the military or wherever before, did you ever coach anybody? Yeah. Just friends. Yeah. Um, because they approach you cause you were the, the workout guy. Yeah. Yeah. It was usually like, Hey dude, 
I bench 405 for a couple reps, but I can't squat it. Will you help me? Yeah, <laughs> please, yeah, please help. Yeah, in the, in the body specific. bear section. <laughs> Oddly specific, but <laughs> but that's I think if I had to give, and I'll let you guys weigh on this. If I, you know, if someone wants to say, hey, I want to coach, like, what's the first thing? Like, well, so this is assuming that you've trained on some level to develop some valuable skill set. Uh, like, you need to be in a place where people can approach you and be approachable. Yeah to allow it to happen. It's not like you just say, you wake up and say, yeah, I've trained a little bit. I'm gonna be a coach. And then like, just wait for Conversely, people. you can't say, I'm gonna train a whole lot and get super, super strong, but I'm gonna be in my garage gym for the entire time. Yeah, where yeah, nobody's yeah. gonna find me, see me, or approach me. In I remember way. there was a, th this guy was like, he lived like 20 miles outside of any like town, yeah. right? Like just, he was literally like, you know, in the middle of nowhere, rel relatively. Yeah, and he's training in his garage, and he's like, how do I coach people? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to town. Yeah. Like, you have to see people and be seen. Yeah. Um, when I was in the commercial gym, I did that for a year before I ended up doing my own thing, and they were real big about working the floor, walk the floor. And some people took that to mean like going up to people and ask them, like, hey, can I train you? But I never did that. I would literally just be- You'd train on the clock and say you were working. Yeah, I, yeah right. <laughs> I, I would just be walking around and I'd wait for somebody to ask me a question. And there were many days where I didn't get asked a question, but I was in that gym. I was waiting on a client that was just gonna come in an hour afterwards, or, I was, or I'd be working out, right? And then people would be like, yeah, I know that you work here. Like, hey, sure. it's, it's, you're, you're almost waiting for people to approach you so that you can demonstrate your skill set that you should be worth refining and working on the time. You're not just saying, I have this skill set, please hire me. You know, that's- Comes across people. as a little desperate. Yeah, so you don't need to advertise your services until you're already like doing something, in which case you can let people know you're open for business. So. Right, and when you're training with people, it's not, as Tom said, it's not just that you're the strongest person even or that you reach this great number, but I think when you're in that environment, people see everything you go through. Mm -hmm. And so they see the different training that you do, the struggles also that you, you have, and they see someone who pushes through something hard and maybe fails and yet gets back to it. And that's also just as important for people to see as seeing somebody who lifts a lot of weight. Yeah. They need to know you stuck with it. So, so I think if you want to coach, yeah, you should be in a gym with other humans training. And if you're not, I don't know that you can coach like that. Like, yeah. you're, then you're just waiting for somebody else to like direct humans towards you. Like, why would they? Well, that exactly. Like, nobody knows that you're an expert. And if you're not trained, if you're untrained, you're probably not an expert. Which you know, sure. Truth hurts. Okay. So Austin, uh, early on in your coach career, like any huge regrets? I think uh, the the early coaching career regret is one of overconfidence, which I think tends to be common um, among many people, especially as they start to learn things. Um, if they learn things from people they put some trust in and they buy into it and they wanna start dispensing this advice, um, it's easy to be overconfident with that sure. and to fall prey to all the cognitive biases that we all know now know much better about. You know, we start to see things work that we expect to work. We tend to dismiss things when they don't work and that doesn't necessarily fit what we expected, just standard kind of confirmation bias stuff. And, and then, you know, additionally, not knowing what you don't know is a huge problem and not appreciating that, that, that there's this whole world of things that you don't understand yet. And so certain pieces of advice that may have been given back then that I definitely regret because now I'm like, well, that was wrong. And maybe some of them I didn't know at the time. Some of them nobody knew at the time because the evidence didn't exist yet, for example. But the the overwhelming thing was, you know, particularly going through that initial process and getting the certification and stuff like that led to an inappropriate amount of confidence in some of the things that were done or some of the advice that was dispensed. And so now things tend to be much more tempered. You think you hurt anybody? Um, in terms of an injury as a result of the advice, um, not that I know of, sure. uh, in terms of like some sort of unquantifiable harm, because I gave them advice that they followed that may not have gotten them as good an outcome as they might've otherwise gotten. Sure. Probably. Yeah. And th those are the kind of things that we count as, as, uh, as harms. Yeah, yeah. So probably from that standpoint. Yeah. Uh, Tom, you think you have any like regrets from your uh, training career, not training, uh, coach career? Yeah, probably um, giving away too much of my time. Like for free?
Yeah, and just in general. Uh, <laughs> I don't in, know what that is. Like, <laughs> in general, probably being uh, overly focused on making sure that like some of my clients were taken care of at my own expense, uh, essentially. Sure. Like I don't, I don't think I, I don't think I really, uh, you know, I, some of the advice I gave probably was not wonderful, but I, I didn't like do anything. I didn't wind up hurting anyone. People tended to make progress. Like I was a positive person. So I, I never like ran into problems where I was like super mean to somebody or, or anything along those lines or dismissive of people. But, uh, yeah, just probably being like actually overly giving at my own expense. Um, of course, of course, Tom say is like, I'm just too nice. That's right. Too nice. Five stars for Tom. Well, so it sounds like, you know, if you had a lot of people coming to you and you're giving away a lot of this time, maybe that was an indication that maybe you were in a place where you could have feasibly charged for coaching yeah. maybe sooner than you ultimately decided to. Yeah. 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 Well, we were talking, there was a, like a pricing question. Like, how do I price myself? It's like, well, how many clients do you have? Yeah. Two. I don't think that's the question yeah. to ask. Yeah, yeah. I don't, well, I don't think that's the question yeah. to ask because that's not limiting or, you know. True. Yeah. Uh, Leah, early mistakes. So I think, you regret. yeah, I think one of my early mistakes that's, that bothers me is insistence on things that didn't matter, you know, like in part because of the, of some things, ways that I had learned how to coach or about lifting just really being too insistent on particulars about programming or what someone does. And it now I really regret that because it didn't matter. And so when you even ask the question, do I think I harmed anybody? I don't think I physically harmed anyone, but I think I harmed at least for a time, some people's progress sure. because I wasn't looking at them as an individual. I had a program or an idea that I was trying to make them all fit. And it's that easy to, I regret. Like, induce neuroses yeah. in people over yeah. that kind of thing, which is I think probably Yeah, a- neuroses or like um, you know, like if we're talking about people who are new to the gym and then they're scared sure. and you're kind of like, well, but you this is what you have to do. This is the correct yeah. way to do it. Yeah, and so that's definitely one of my regrets. But I'm really like I don't know that that lasted a very long time. Because I think when you are a good coach, you pay attention to people. So like Tom said, you start to see what people need. You want them to do well. So then you have to start thinking about why am I doing this? Should I ask more questions? Should I change things? And then you become a better coach. Uh, yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. Okay. Uh, Alan, how many uh, are like what sort of things early on in your gym ownership slash coaching career um do you think you regret definitely uh misleading information with regard to uh setbacks specifically like pain and injury um i always felt like i had to give an answer or i had to be this point of authority that knew oh your shoulder hurts because of you know, these trigger points or because of this and that, or let's mash this up, or we need to start doing these corrective exercises. Um, or, you know, uh, I've, count, I've encountered a number of people who've had a back tweak, you know, uh, and just uh, going about it the wrong way, uh, right, yeah. probably doing all the wrong things um, and, you know, babying it, uh, checking up on them, you know, way too much. Or like, from my standpoint of like, I don't, I know what this was like for them. I don't want it to happen again. So I'm going to like just avoid this and this and this, uh, making the situation worse. Um, so I would say definitely from that. It's a common thing for when you're in a position of authority like that, it, there's this concept called commission bias where, you know, it's this, this tendency to feel like you have to do something about the situation all the time. Um, and you know, it, it's very uncomfortable to sometimes say, you know, I'm not necessarily sure what the best course of action is, or that perhaps the best course of action is to not immediately do something about the situation. And so particularly when you have people who are paying you, presumably for your, you know, they're paying you and they want your advice. You're like, yeah, do this. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, yeah. And, and I felt like if something happened, uh, uh, that, you know, someone's freaking out about it, if they pop their back and they, they're laying on the ground, uh, I feel like I'm, if I'm not like at their level of reacting, uh, that I was almost like being dismissive, you know, like 
yeah, you're fine. You know? uh, <laughs> so I felt like I had to like get get on their level, you know what I mean, and and overreact too. So yeah, now, just didn't... now you know a whole lot more about what, right. <laughs> what was going on there, right? That's funny. Yeah. I th- I think also just from some of the answers, weightlifting's probably pretty safe as yeah. you know things go. It's rare to like actually you know generally don't concuss people. You know, speak for from, yourself. Well, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, Depends how many kettlebells you're using. Like people, people will people will tweak things, or people will you know it, you'll see like minor strains and things like that. But it's pretty rare that you know, especially when you're coaching somebody, that something catastrophic happens. Yeah, yeah. I think I have similar regrets for all like just as far as like being overconfident in things, telling people information that was wrong or like unknown at the time, mm-hmm. and being very confident about it. Uh, and then always feeling like I had to do something or have an answer. I mean, that certainly happened just nonstop. The only other thing I regret, uh, it's actually similar to Tom's thing where he's like, oh, too much, gave too much of myself. (laughs) You didn't say that. But there was, I mean, definitely a period of time where I was trying to do too much coaching and too much business stuff, like just too much work to where I couldn't operate at the level that I wanted to operate at. And that would be, that was a mistake. But I, I think the message to the listener viewers, like if you want to be a coach, like you're going to screw up a lot and that's okay. But you can, we can kind of cut that learning uh, curve off. <laughs> we can argue about learning curves on the sure. podcast. We can cut that off by, by saying you can't know all the information and what you're very confident about what you know is, is you're probably less confident. It's not like a, a indictment on you know somebody's knowledge base. It's just you have to be very okay or comfortable being uncertain about things, mm-hmm. and then you know um, not necessarily. You know, people think you have to be like very confident to sell folks on your expertise, and that's not necessarily the case. One of the biggest dem- you know, demonstrations of expertise is being like, I actually don't know the answer to that, or I'm not sure how confident I am in this answer, or you know. You hear that kind of thing a lot from actual, yes, you know, actual experts, <laughs> experts in a yes. field. Yes, <laughs> so. yes. So, like, you know, people are like, "Well, I, I don't feel comfortable starting because I don't know if I, I know enough." I'm like, "That's actually a sign that you might, you know, <laughs> you may actually be ready." <laughs> um, you know, uh, so I don't know that somebody will ever feel 100 percent ready, to, like, to start coaching, like, from a knowledge base. But if you feel like you have all the answers and you're, you know, ready to go, then I, I would strongly advise you to like temper that you know down and and understand that five years from now if you start if you're starting today you're going to think back and shudder at a lot of things that you said and did and hopefully you don't hurt anybody but because weightlifting is so safe we're not usually like uh hurting folks i did have a guy who i trained drunk i wasn't drunk he was drunk and i allowed him to train while he was drunk he's he said he really because he was like i really want to do this like, I really, I don't want to miss a session. I just, I've been at a happy hour. And, and, We're going to go know. run laps outside. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird, that was a weird deal. That was a weird deal. I, you know, in hindsight. I take it he lived. Uh, yeah, he was fine. He, yeah. You know, it just did a, not a great session. And um, anyway, all right. So let's talk about certifications for a second. So we, everybody, nobody up here besides me, like spent a whole bunch of money on certifications. Now, being veteran senior coaches in the actual strength conditioning field and unique in a way that you're actually making money in the strength conditioning field, unlike the vast majority of people in the strength conditioning field who are only in it for a few years because they're not making enough money and then move on to something else. How do you guys view certifications? Like, do you think there are any like very useful certifications that you would like recommend people get? Or how do you feel about that? Someone's like, I want to come work at your gym, Alan. What certification do I need? So, um, I used to, uh, like, you know, bash commercial gyms and all the popular, uh, certifications say they're all BS and they don't do anything. Uh, but I'll give one example of, uh, a, a guy I used to train, uh, Punch Nugget, oh, yeah. John Mead. Uh, yeah. Trained him when he was when he was <laughs> his name's John. When he was 17, um, <clears throat> he eventually uh, decided that he wanted to start coaching too. Um, and so, without me saying anything, he got uh, a couple certifications and he got uh, a job as a personal trainer at California Family Fitness. And he's now the number one trainer um, in in like all of Northern California. Oh, wow. um, he works. He loves it. 
I wouldn't be crazy about it, but he, he will work like 16 hour days, like clients, 45 minute sessions, back, 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 just nonstop. And then go to gym and train. Um, and he's loving it. And he, he eventually wants to go somewhere more with the coaching, but for now he's getting like hands-on, uh, clients every day, all day, seven days a week, if you wanted. Um, in fact, one of my, uh, barbell medicine clients, <clears throat> reached out to me and said his uh, dad wants some coaching. They live uh, uh, yeah. in the area. Uh, and I was like, hey, I'm booked. John's good. Uh, and so so he went, anyways, he signed, uh, John just sent me a text that he's purchased 72 sessions wow. with John. But anyways, uh, he got the you know uh, basic certifications. He's working in a commercial gym uh, and he loves it. He's getting a lot of coaching experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, in that sense, yeah, but you don't that's have- good. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I'm just telling stories now, but, uh, but as far as like, which <laughs> well, one you're I saying that in so far as it gets you to a place where you can acquire the real experience, not that they're a replacement for sale. Right. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's uh, a good idea to say, I just want to go get hired at nine to five. And if that's the case and you do need certifications, nobody's going to say like, wow, you're a really strong dude. And you, you've got experience that, you know, they want on paper, what certifications do you have? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and so in that sense, it's, it is definitely useful and necessary. Uh, Leo, what do you, what do you think if you were going to recommend a certification for somebody to get? Yeah. So I don't have a, a certification to recommend. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, in my mind, what would maybe take the place of it is a certification, at least for me. And I think for a lot of other people, even this story demonstrates that someone has put in a certain amount of time and personal effort. And so I would encourage somebody to find other ways to dem- to do that and then show that. So that people see this really does matter to you. Tom, you got a cert that you like, you, got a fa- you fancy or no? I don't, I don't know that I have like enough of an informed opinion to say one way or the other. Well, I mean, do you want to talk about the starting strength cert? I could. Well, so the, the question is, because we all had that certification, all have uh, given it up. But the question is, do you think it is a good cert for somebody to like, go I go get because and I say this by thinking like most of us are saying if you need a certification just go get one so you can get experience but the process of getting the starting strength cert requires more experience more it's more involved but does it put you in a better place as a coach I think that's dependent upon what you want to do because if you want to work in a commercial gym, the answer is generally no, because they'll be looking for a CSCS. Right, uh, yeah, or an ASM or something, yeah, sure. Getting a starting strength certification will make you appeal to a segment of the population that's aware of starting strength. And also the kind of emphasis on being competent at seeing and cueing movement on a couple of the lifts is valuable. Yeah, can uh, can be sure. Yeah, and like, even the, even though we would differ in certain regards on a programming front, the idea that like, you can kind of have something of a focus and get stronger and work on these things in like a systematic way is also useful. Um, the general concept, sure. Have anything to add to that, Austin? I mean, I think that you know we look at some of the coaches that we've brought on here so like alan for example like joe uh like leah like hassan um you know multiple of our coaches that we have brought on are people who you and i kind of mentored and you know i think that i feel better about the, the, you know, the people who I have mentored and, and, and kind of brought up where I can say unequivocally, you know, I trust Alan to do effectively ever, everything from a coaching programming standpoint. He knows what his scope is. He knows when something is no longer within his scope. He has the appropriate degree of kind of calibrating his uncertainty meter with things when he knows what he knows and what he, when he doesn't know what he doesn't know. And I can say that for all the people that I've kind of mentored. And so I, I, I like that model of, of, you know, of, of, uh, of kind of coaching development, education, stuff like that. Of course, it's a more time intensive process and things like that. Um, so, you know, perhaps finding somebody that you, it, it's, it's analogous to what we did in residency, 
going through that process under, you know, that kind of degree of supervision, which again, yep, it's very time intensive, but that's kind of the, the way that we develop that kind of uh, level of competence. And so, you know, maybe, uh, whereas for example, in contrast, somebody who just says, I got this certification, um, under no circumstance do I have that like unequivocal trust in your ability to do anything ver compared to the person who maybe I have mentored or say the person you have mentored, I can say, oh, I, I have a good idea of what they would do and I have, you know, full confidence in that. And so, you know, if, if you're looking to get started in the coaching game and, you know, you are, you're training, you're in a public place, you're doing all these, all these things that we've talked about so far maybe the final way to try to cap it off is some sort of kind of like, you know, finding somebody who maybe you like the way they do things or you, you aspire to their practice model and seeing if you can intern with them or, or, you know, work under them in some fashion, which is something that we've done with, with again, lots of people who we ultimately end up saying, Hey, you're ready to go. Let's hire you and bring, bring you on. Yeah, exactly. Well, not necessarily for us, but whoever, whoever that may be to you and in, in maybe in your activity of choice or your sport of choice or whatever the case is, I think that's how, you know, a lot of practical expertise gets developed uh, much more effectively than taking a taking a, a, a course or achieving a certification or something like that. Yeah. Because even like when we can't got spit out of medical school, we had been through all the classroom stuff. We had the certification that is the MD. We didn't know what the hell to do with our first patient that we saw, right? Until we went through the process of that that time intensive mentorship and guidance and correction and making mistakes and and, and that kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. I. I I think that, I mean, I agree with you, that would be the best way to actually grow your skill set versus acquiring different certifications. I don't think there's any certification that I would recommend above another other than you need to probably have one to get yourself a job. And so you would make sure that that, that uh, comes, that whatever certification you get is associated with some sort of insurance that you can opt into mm -hmm. because that you, you just need that. But there's not a certification out there that grants you a skill set that I think is worth the cost of attendance, the price of attendance. So for instance, getting a USAW like certification, like if you want to work with weightlifters, probably going to have to have that certification or at least have gone through their coaching system because you know that they tend to stay within their own groups, but it doesn't make you a great Olympic weightlifter or Olympic weightlifting coach. Uh, getting the starting strength certification certifies that you can coach to a reasonable standard, like these handful of lifts under a very specific model that is not you know, universal and is not necessarily the only way to do those exercises. And so you're constrained, but like, you know, if you're not going to grow past that, maybe that's fine, but it's, there's a big cost there. Getting a CSCS doesn't make you like a college level strength conditioning coach. Uh, and so, and there are different costs uh, associated with this. So since none of these are going to bring you a, a, enough business to like warrant getting one over another, I just don't care. So my recommendation is get the cheapest certification that you can get that is universally accepted. So the CSCS is actually like relatively inexpensive if you have a college degree. The ACSM, HFS, again, is reasonably inexpensive and the test materials are reasonably inexpensive and it's universally accepted. Those would be my two like ones that I'd recommend if you're trying to work in a commercial gym setting. Um, I, I, if you have to get a NASM cert because that's the only one the gym accepts, yeah, I would prefer not, but you know, maybe find a different gym. Um, but there are no like specialty certs that I think are worthwhile to get as far as actually improving your knowledge base in a way that makes you a better coach. In other words, should you go through the process to obtain these certifications, you should not come out the other end under the impression that you are actually a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Yeah, exa exactly. Like you just, you have a piece of paper that allows you to start your journey. It's yeah. not the end. Yeah. And so people are like, well, what about this one nutritional one? I'm like, nope, not that one either. Like, well, what about this one kettlebell like special? Nope, not that one either. <laughs> well, what about, it's like, no, no. Like they're all like minimum requirements for you to like get a piece of paper. It doesn't mean that you're qualified. The, the only nutrition thing that I know that qualifies you to be, to work on somebody's nutrition is a registered it's dietetics. <laughs> yeah, after you've done all your internship. Sure. Yeah, the thousand hours that's required. So, okay, moving along. We've got two questions left. Uh, we'll go down the row. We'll start with uh, Tom. Quality or qualities or quality that you think is very important as a coach? Uh, I think I think there's probably two things. One is some level of technical expertise, whatever that means. Like you need to you need to be able to see movement, cue movement, or understand programming in some form or fashion. Like the the kind of 
basic technical knowledge. But outside of that, I think that uh, like being personable or being compassionate and being able to relate to a lot of people and to tailor your approach to whoever it is you're working with is as important and in some ways more important than like the straight up technical skill I've seen. I've seen people who are great lifters or who know a lot um, fail very badly when interacting with their lifters. And I think like you need to be able to relate to your lifter. I think I was probably thinking similar along similar lines in addition to the expected level of knowledge base. Communication skills is kind of how I would summarize it. And, and it, communication skills, can you relate to your lifter? Like the example that Alan gave earlier with the back pain, knowing how to respond and communicate in that sort of a situation to drive the boat in the right direction and not in the wrong direction, which of course itself requires a little bit of extra background knowledge as to what you should be doing and how this stuff works. Um, uh, being able to kind of read social cues, which you know, it's like some people yeah. have a yeah. bit of difficulty with that. And, you know, reading, you know, if, if you are just completely missing all these red flags that your lifter is throwing up at you, you know, during, during the session and you're not able to respond to them and modify things accordingly if needed or provide reassurance if no modification needed, things like that, where you can read, reflect, communicate really effectively, you know, uh, uh, to guide them along the path, whatever that may be, whether that's training related or, you know, through a, through a bout of rehab or, um, you know, if they, enter a competition, the kind of communication that happened between like a coach and an athlete on a meet day or something like that, mm -hmm. the communication skills um, are super, super important. And that's something that takes year, probably years to develop True. Um, lots of mistakes, lots of like foot in mouth moments um, and, and may, may actually benefit from having that kind of mentorship that I described earlier, where it's somebody who's watching you interact or communicate with somebody. And this is something like in, in medicine, I do with the residents that I work with and have them communicate with the patient. I'm like, you know, afterwards we step out and we debrief and here's how I would have said this. I would have maybe said this a little differently. I could see on their face, they responded, you know, maybe scared them a little bit or maybe, you know, things like that. So, so I agree with Tom that the communication skills in some situations are probably even more important than knowing the, the raw, you know, science or, or technical data or something like that. Sure. Yeah. I don't disagree with, either of you. I just think as far as like how to acquire said things, like I think the fund knowledge is really important. And I think to acquire that, I, my general advice is find three sort of people or groups that you like find very trustworthy, right? And the way that you would ascertain that is like, do, are they credentialed? Is their track record like on par with like academia? Like, you know, things that kind of give them sort of like so like in the within their social groups are they valued as like high you know quality content producers like they have all these sort of check marks like okay cool they you know they're phds or they're mds or they're you know veteran coaches and all this they have a bunch of social currency because they put out a bunch of good content and and they actually have content that's available for you to consume like those are the three like things and pick three of them and read everything they put out and watch just do that be, because you're trying to get, gain this fund of knowledge and you can't read everybody and you can't, you know, see every. So the idea is that you're going to start somewhere, start with three people. So that's like, again, the fund of knowledge, I think is super important for the communications thing. I don't think you can like take a class on how to do that and be, you know, you, you can take classes on this, but you also have to do it and practice it and get feedback. Um, and I think that's when you, you, probably one of the bigger things that happens when people start coaching and they do it for a long enough period of time, they develop their own coaching style, their own coaching voice, their own interview voice and style and stuff. And they start kind of, yeah, be, or they're able to express the personality that they want to project uh, a little more clearly um, and be able to be adaptable to different situations based on different clients' needs, wants, et cetera. But you just, ha you have to practice that. Um, and I think what happens now, most of the times people go in, they're not necessarily rapidly expanding their fund of knowledge and they're not necessarily trying to become a better communicator outside of selling people on stuff. Right, you know, it's like, hey, do you wanna work out with me today? Like, you know, buy, buy this package, which I'm not, you, you have to ultimately end up selling your 
skill set because if uh, you know you could be the best have the best fund of knowledge and all this other stuff but if you have no clients you're not a coach so you end up having to ask for money at some point <laughs> like you never ask for money you never get paid Leah, do you have anything different? Is it the same? I don't think I really have anything different. I think I would just sum it up by saying you have to be really, really committed to being an expert. Yeah. What about, yeah. For what, what about for women though? Anything different for women? <laughs> Maybe. Yes. You need to have the right hormones. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yes. Well, so, but it, yeah, but like for, for women, for women, because this is a male dominated yes, field, why do you think is. that is? Oh, I mean, that's like a huge question. I, why does, is coaching, a, why is coaching a male dominated? In the well, number one, I just don't think there's enough women who pre- pursue strength and conditioning themselves. So then why would they, why would we have women who are coaching? You, you gotta have less because there's less women there's, involved. Right, sure. right. right. Um, and then it is a pretty, um, uh, it's a pretty unique and at times difficult field to go into if you are a woman and it, you can feel like you're out of, like you're out of your element really easily. And I, I mean, I think. Yeah, all right. Editing. Yeah. Yeah, that's famous last words. <laughs> Uh, okay. So we'll just go down the line. Last question here. So one piece of advice that you can give to somebody who wants to start coaching, what would it be? Austin. Um, I'll probably echo the same advice we give to people when they want to come back from an injury. It's going to be to embrace the process, meaning that you need to accept that it's going to take a long time. Uh, you need to accept that, you know, you're going to make a bunch of mistakes. Um, you need to accept that even if you feel really confident about something like you probably shouldn't be. (laughs) Uh, And, and, um, you know, we, even at this stage in the game, we're changing things that we do on a regular basis. We're reading voraciously all the time, uh, updating our thinking on things and, and are almost becoming less certain of things every, (laughs) every day. Regular. Sure. Learn. Yeah. And that's kind of just comes with, comes with the territory in terms of embracing the process of, of self-improvement really in anything. Um, so that's what I would, that's what I'd recommend. Uh, I think my recommendation would be to really accept the fact that uh, love that you are going to be a professional coach because it's kind of easy to just start training people in You're on some the side. fashion. Yeah. 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 But if this is something you really want to do, it is not easy to get to that point where it is your profession, but you have to be very committed as far as learning and time and money and how you carry yourself and all of that to being a professional coach. I agree. There are a lot of people doing a part-time. I got two or three clients. Like, I don't know if you want them as your coach and I don't know if they're really serious about coaching. Right. Right. No offense. Yeah. I mean, someone can enjoy that. That can be their little hobby, but if a coach is really what you want to be, it has to be serious. It'd probably be what I just said. I don't know if the camera. Got it. <laughs> uh, I feel like that. Yeah, that was my answer to just know your uh, uh, your target client. Um, and again, that can be as specific as you want or uh, as general as you'd like. You know, obviously, uh, don't be so rigid in your approach and be able to. Uh, you know, I only want powerlifters with <laughs> plus five hundred wilts. <laughs> yeah, really. Be able to adjust on the fly when helping someone, but uh, yeah, understanding maybe as general as like I'd like to uh, teach people about strength training. Um, I think it's good to have that and kind of stick with that. Um, and I'm, you know, not going to try my best to help a triathlete. I might refer them somewhere else, you know, so. I think uh, you have to be willing to eat your own dog food. I think that. What? Uh, <laughs> 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 I think that part of coaching uh, should be exposing yourself to the things that you ask of your clients. Uh, and I think it winds up informing your coaching practice and continuing to inform your coaching practice. If you are doing things, obviously you will have clients that need to do things that are different than what you do, but still, uh, being in touch with what it is to, if you are a barbell coach to do barbell training yourself, uh, I think is important. I think you guys have excellent answers. I think a lot of the content in here has been stuff that we wish that somebody had told us early on in our coaching careers. The only thing I'm going to add, cause I haven't said it 
yet. And I do think this is a really important part of actually building a coaching business. Like if you actually want to do this professionally is content generation. And so when somebody ever, some, somebody comes to me about business related issue, they're like, well, my business isn't taking off my business. And you know, the first thing I'm saying, well, are you training your garage? Like, does anybody know that you're training? Does anybody know that you're an expert? If no, like get out of your garage, go to the gym, like talk to people, whatever. But the other part of that is content generation. Like what have you created for the community lately to dem not only demonstrate your expertise, but demonstrate your interests in things, demonstrate your being a professional, demonstrate your dog food to, uh, to take it back to Tom. So it's like, I think content is king. And so you should be writing things. You should be making videos. You should, it doesn't mean start a podcast. Like if you don't have an idea, <laughs> like, so you don't have to start a podcast, but if that's your jam, like go for it, you know? So, but I think like with writing stuff, for instance, if you have a topic, you're going to look it up, like look up a bunch of stuff and you're going to learn things. So it's like self-exploration. Same thing. If you made a video, you're like, Oh, I'm gonna make a video on carbohydrate intake. I, I don't know, whatever. And you're like, Oh, maybe I should like learn something about this first. So I have content. And then you end up, and then you end up like learning a bunch of stuff you didn't know. So content all, not only informs you, but also creates a service to the community. Also uh, demonstrates your expertise, demonstrates your professionalism, demonstrates what you're interested in. And so if you're not creating content yet and you want to be a coach or you are a coach and you're feeling like, ah, what do I do now? Like I have a spare time, like create stuff, create content, as much content as you can create, the better. So that's why, uh, what did I, when we first recorded this, I think I told you like my mantra when I like started doing this was like, I want to be prolific. Like I want people to look back and say, when I was in medical school, like you see all the articles that like came out, all the videos, all the content, like the dude was prolific. Mm -hmm. Like, so that's like one of the, my motivating like mantras when I'm trying to create something or whatever. It's like, you know, if I were prolific, I would probably just finish this right now instead of watching another episode of Family Guy. So <laughs> uh, anyway, from the Barbell Medicine crew to you, thank you so much for watching. This has been a coaching podcast. Uh, if you catch it on YouTube, hit, make sure you hit subscribe. Uh, hit, give it a like if you dug the video. Leave us a comment below. That really helps us out. Also, if you're listening to this on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from, leave us a five-star rating and a review. We read all of them. It's really helpful and helps other people discover our podcast. So thank you so much. Catch you guys next time. I think this is a, a fun question, and I like to ask Austin <laughs> these fun questions first, because on the spot. Spirit animal. So yeah, what's yeah. your spirit animal? A dolphin, <laughs> because they like swim fast. They're also like hairless, That's like me. <laughs> That's the funny part.